I took this image quite a few years ago during the Major League Baseball playoffs, the ALCS, the American League Championship Series. The game was slotted for a 3 p.m. start time, which is unusual for playoffs. Usually, um, especially in a big market like New York City, games would start at 7.30 or 8 p.m. And I thought on my way to the ballpark, wow, we could really get some some special light for this game. I, I wonder if I could make a special picture. So I got to the ballpark early, as I always do, and I traversed my way up to the top before fans arrived to the stands, into the ballpark, and I scouted a position that would require me sitting in a fan seat to make this picture. I noted the seat, headed back down to the field, started to shoot batting practice, and then when the game began, got into my photo position and started to shoot the game. And in a game like this, there's probably 50 or more photographers, and we're all pretty much shooting the same thing. And as the game progressed, sure enough, the light just got more and more beautiful. And I thought, well, do I make my move, which may sound a little silly, but during a playoff games, for those of you who know, and I can see some in the audience who certainly know, you just really don't leave your, your photo position, especially at Yankee Stadium. But I decided I'm going to do it. I'm going to make my move. And I traversed my way up to the top, the taking the stairs through the 55,000 people, and found the seat, introduced myself to the fan. And lucky for me, he said yes, I could shoot from his position. And uh, we're still Facebook friends today. Um, and I made this picture. And that is what sports photography is for me. I'm not interested in making 200 mediocre pictures. I'm trying to make one, to make one special photo. And sometimes you take risks to make that photo, and sometimes there is, for your risk, you have no reward. You know, what if I miss an Aaron Judge home run? Okay, no risk, no reward. I got so excited after I made this picture that I wondered, what would it be like outside with this beautiful late October light that you only get you know, in the later months during baseball? So I went outside, and I made this picture against the facade. The light was so beautiful. And by the time I got back inside, got through security, got back to my photo position, all the photographers in my section were saying, is everything OK? Are you OK? Where have you been? You missed so much. But I was more than OK, because on that day, I made a special picture. One of my photography heroes, and probably yours as well, is Henri Cartier-Bresson. And these four quotes from him sum it up for me. And you may ask, well, what does a 1940 surrealist photographer have to do with a modern day sports photographer? And for me, it's everything, because you can't make a great picture unless you know what one is. So these four quotes, if I go to a place that's trying to make a picture that concretizes a situation, at one glance says everything. A strong relation of shapes, which for me is essential. A visual pleasure, geometry, structure, an intellectual pleasure to have everything in the right place. And the difference between, and all you sports photographers know this, between a good picture and a mediocre picture, it's a question of millimeters. A small difference, but it's essential. And my favorite, it's seldom that we make a great picture. We have to milk the cow quite a lot and get plenty of milk to make a little cheese. As my photography career in sports progressed, I became the traveling photographer for the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum. The museum wanted to attract a younger audience. The marketing department wanted to attract a younger audience through social media. Social media was just starting to heat up in baseball and in the world. So they tasked me with tying the contemporary game back to history. And it was tremendous years of growth for me, um, and my job became far more reaching. And it was there that I learned to become a visual storyteller. And it also gave me a year-round shooting schedule in baseball, which I still have today, starting in spring training 
And then every four years, we have something special called the World Baseball Classic, which is where all these countries participate. For well, who's the best in the world? This year, it was 20 countries that participated. Japan and Shohei Otani was the star of the show, and they took home the trophy, and so was their manager. And it's very special because they're playing for country pride, and it only happens every four years. And the regular season then begins, and I travel to ballparks, shooting the game and storytelling the major league game. And then the postseason begins, and it starts with a wild card. It ends with a World Series. And people will ask me, well, who's your favorite team? Who do you want to win? Who are you rooting for? And it's not a cop out. I really don't have a favorite team. All I'm looking for is to always root for a game seven, because I never want it to end. But it does end, and somebody gets a trophy. And then there's a parade. And then the fun begins, because there's baseball played somewhere in the world all the time. And then the Caribbean series, the, well, the, the baseball in the Caribbean, all of their seasons begin. Puerto Rico, Cuba, Venezuela, Panama, Mexico, Colombia, and all these countries play their regular season, and then they play what's called the Caribbean series. And this year, this past year, Colombia won for the first time in history. And it was, it's a very exciting level of play. It's very festive. And they're playing for country pride. So it means a lot for these countries to take home that trophy. While shooting the professional game with the Baseball Hall of Fame and before then, I always continued to shoot the amateur game, the grassroots game. And still today, it's my favorite part of the game. It's before money and contracts and lockouts. So if I'm in Japan and I'm shooting the World Baseball Classic, I take time to find a Little League game in Tokyo. Or if I'm in the Dominican Republic shooting Winter League, I might wander the streets of San Pedro de Macorís looking for baseball. High school games in Mobile, Alabama. Little League games in Oakland, California. Old guys playing stickball on the streets of New York City. This is singer-songwriter Paul Simon, his second round of me and Julio down by the schoolyard. A pickup game in Havana, Cuba. And that's how my first book, Grassroots Baseball, Where Legends Begin, came about. I connected with Hall of Famers and asked them if they would tell their stories of their young years, their younger years of playing baseball in the regions they grew up in. And I had a chance to work with the Hall of Famers, taking portraits and doing projects with them. But this was very special, because their stories of their younger years was something that I hadn't heard before. And everybody knows about their playing years. But their young years were just not told. And so I paired them with these images, these grassroots images for each section. And guys like Ricky Henderson just told great stories of what it was like growing up. He said that he didn't want to play baseball. He wanted to play football. His mom wanted him to play baseball. And we all know mothers know best. So, uh, so anyway, she, uh, the mom had the coach pick uh, Ricky up uh, after school to go to practice. And in the back seat would be a glazed donut and a hot chocolate waiting for him. And that's how he decided that baseball might be a sport. Guys like Hank Aaron from Mobile, Alabama, tells an incredible story of what it was like. He started in the Negro Leagues and then played in Major League Baseball at 20 years old with the early days of integration. And he had tremendous adversity that he faced his whole baseball career during that time in the 1950s, early 50s. I had a chance to photograph Hank Aaron's childhood home in Mobile, Alabama, and I invited four historically black high school baseball teams to join me at Hank's home and pose for this picture. And I invited them all to please come in full uniform, and they're teenagers, so I wasn't quite sure who was going to show up. There was only one day where they didn't have games and they just had practices. But they did. They showed up, and we made this picture. And we talked about Hank Aaron and what it was like for him growing up with this tremendous adversity. And then we talked about their adversity, their socioeconomic adversity, because baseball has become an expensive sport, and it's really divided the have and the have-nots, where equipment is expensive, private lessons, travel ball that a lot of kids can't afford. So we took this picture, and we talked about it a lot, and we left uh, Hank's rocking chair open in honor of him. 
Guys like Whitey Ford talks about how wonderful it was to grow up in New York City and then have the chance to work and play for the New York Yankees back in the 50s. Rest in peace, Whitey Ford. Nolan Ryan tells a great story of what it was like to, to grow up in Texas with parents who really instilled values in him at a very young age that he took to baseball, delivering newspapers with his dad at two and three in the morning every day. And Vladimir Guerrero was the third Hall of Famer, inducted to the Hall of Fame, the third Dominican player to be inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame, coming from this tiny town of Don Gregorio in the Dominican Republic, where there's dirt roads, and him and his family all still live in Don Gregorio today. And uh, you know, he does have the biggest house in Don Gregorio, I'll give you that. But um, it's just an incredible feat to come from such humble beginnings and not only make it to Major League Baseball, but make it to the Baseball Hall of Fame and inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame, where only where less than 1% of Major League Baseball players make it, and what a story he is. Shooting the grassroots game, the amateur game, is very different for me than shooting a professional game. Baseball is played the same everywhere, but it looks different in different places. And that's what's interesting about it, the stories of baseball, the geography, the topography. Cathedrals versus the sandlots. Action is certainly still part of the grassroots game, and it's exhilarating to shoot. But these images need to tell so much more. It needs to tell a story, show a sense of place, and ideally, show the culture. After Grassroots Baseball Where Legends Begin, my first book was released, I wanted to do something more and give back. And I was in a point in my life where I wanted to give back to the craft I love and give back to the sport I love. And I started teaching a lot more, which I still do today, is teaching a lot more sports photography workshops. I work with a group called Summit Workshops, and they're terrific. And it's just wonderful for me to be able to give back in that way and also give back to the sport I love. And so we, uh, with a partner, Jeff Idelson, who had retired from the Baseball Hall of Fame, announced his retirement, I reached out and asked if he wanted to co-found with me Grassroots Baseball, a not-for-profit, promoting and celebrating the amateur game. And our first initiative was to give back to underprivileged communities at the youngest level. We decided to start our not-for-profit along Route 66 because it doesn't get more Americana than baseball on Route 66. So we got ourselves an RV and a bunch of sponsors, and we started in Chicago. We ended in Santa Monica. Jeff drove the RV the whole time. He also pumped all the diesel, and I edited my photos in the back. We connected with Boys and Girls Club and partnered with them all the way through uh, the Route 66. Minor league ballparks opened their doors to us. Hall of Famers joined us all along Route 66 to give lessons to kids, taught them how to throw a ball, how to play catch, words of inspiration. And it was just a terrific experience for these kids. Each kid got a new Rawlings baseball glove and ball thanks to our very generous sponsors. And young players got a chance to meet their heroes from the very same small towns that they grew up in along Route 66. This is a fun story, Johnny Bench in uh, Oklahoma City. We were pulling up in our RV with, with Johnny and this young man with his parents was looking at Johnny's statue and I asked him, would you like to see your statue come alive? He absolutely had no idea who, what I was talking about and he didn't know who Johnny Bench was, but his parents did and it was an exciting moment where he signed his cap and the parents got to meet Johnny. And all of this is about a lot more than baseball. Sure, as you can see, I'm quite partial to baseball, but we all know that kids who play sports have better outcomes in life. They have better outcomes in health, better outcomes in their academics. And that's what this is about. Sure, it's, it's for me, it's baseball.
but really it's any sport. It's getting kids away from the video games and outside and having healthier outcomes, improve physical health, mental health, and of course teaches important life skills. We spent three years along Route 66, and it was just an absolute blast, and my second book, Grassroots Baseball, Route 66, came out of that. And like the first book, Hall of Famers and retired players, legends from their areas, told stories of what it was like growing up along Route 66, and it goes through eight states. And my job was similar to the first book, where I was telling the stories of these urban cities and small towns, Oklahoma looks different than Kansas. Texas had different stories to tell than the Pueblos of New Mexico. And the light in Arizona, that beautiful light in the desert, looks very different than the sunsets in Santa Monica. And I also got to flex some different photography muscles for this project, shooting the Americana all along Route 66 and intertwining it with the stories of baseball. It made this, the project more interesting for me to be able to shoot something different, and it also widened the audience for the book. This is the balloon fiesta in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I was supposed to shoot this my first year of the project, and the timing didn't work out, and I missed it. And I thought, no problem, I'll shoot it the second year, and then COVID happened, and there was no balloon fiesta, and then I had to beg the publisher in year three to please keep these pages open, because I need balloon photos in this book. Because the uh, legend who tells his story, he starts off talking about seeing balloons and bal the balloon fiesta and how big of a deal that was in Albuquerque. Alex Bregman from the Astros. So I took this picture, it was my very last photo of the, uh, for, the, for the book, and I was in a media balloon, and we went up, and it was a beautiful sunrise, and I made my pictures, and then we weren't able to land. Uh, for some reason, balloons are tricky, and the wind, and where we're going to land, and there's all these balloons, and we were up there for hours, absolute hours. The light was ugly. It was you know, just harsh 11 a.m. light. I ran out of things to talk about with this pilot. We talked sports, we talked kids, we talked everything. And uh, then I was saying things like, how about there? Can we land there? And which, of course, is ridiculous. Um, but what he did do is he told me that he said that balloons, he said, do you know that balloons have the right of way over every other aircraft in the sky? And that is because they have absolutely no control over the balloon. So that's my first and last time in a balloon. Anyway. Uh, so the train's rolling down the track and grassroots baseball, our not-for-profit, now has a new initiative. And we are telling the stories of women and girls in baseball past, present, and future, and around the globe. And women are not new to baseball. The door has opened and closed for us throughout history, starting in 1866 with Vassar College, the first uh, women's baseball team. And then uh, during World War II, our Major League Baseball players went off to war, and Mr. Wrigley, who owned the Cubs, um, sent his scouts out to look for women's softball players and convert them to baseball players. And that's when the first women's baseball league uh, came about, the AAGPBL, the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League. I had a chance to interview a few of these women. One is Maybell Blair, 95 years old. She was one of the women that a league of their own uh, was based on. Here's a little clip of Maybell. We followed a pretty strict one. code, you know, ladylike skirts, lipstick along with your mitt. You know, what was your reaction to wearing it when you saw the uniform you were supposed to wear and having a look at it? What did you think? No problem whatsoever, you know. The only thing uh, I didn't like about it is when you slid, you'd get gravel in your rear end and it's still sticking here if you want to feel it. That was the problem, was uh, the girls just getting uh, terrible strawberries, uh, but we didn't go on the DL list for two months like the men do when they break their fingernail. We had to play or we would be replaced, and that's what happened. 
This is a very new and different project for me. Um, I'm doing a lot of firsts. This is my first time um, in video in a very significant way. My first time directing, my first time producing. I'm doing all the interviews because it's a woman in baseball interviewing women in baseball. Um, and also, uh, I'm still taking the stills for the project because I want a, a book as part of this project to, to come out of it. Um, and even though now I'm entering this video world, my heart is still in still photography and always will be. I carry my A1 camera wherever I go. And as we're doing this project, the cinematographer that I'm working with says, well, we got to put you behind there. And I'm like, well, I still got to do both because I'm not giving up my, my still photography just yet. And the thing about, just going back for a second, um, doing something like this, doing something new for the first time and having this you know, momentous uh, project with so many news, working with partners like Sony and like b &H is so important to me, and I do want to make that, and you can say, well, this is a plug, and yeah, I guess it is, but having partners and having companies that you're working with that where you're values align really mean a lot because you're you're trying to do a lot and you have a lot of questions especially with this video gear for me i need i have so many questions about how it all works and what i'm supposed to be using and and anybody at b and h can help me you know and that's a really important thing it's not about just buying the gear it's not about just selling the gear it's really a partnership and it's really a big reminder now that I make, I make the phone call. And in a day and age where you can't get anybody on the phone anymore. I mean, have you tried to call a bank lately? I mean, it's like you can't, there's nobody to talk to. And so being able to pick up the phone, not only get somebody to answer, but get somebody who knows what they're talking about and who has the knowledge is a big deal to me. And so that's my point there. I'm going to keep going. Anyway, Women in Baseball, um, we just got started with this project, but already we're moving along. We had the first Women's College Club Championship in Compton, California. And then they played their second year, um, and their level of play got a little better. The first woman coach in Major League Baseball, Alyssa Nacken, who's in my backyard in San Francisco. Kellyanne Jenkins is uh, one of the 20 women who are playing college baseball, played college baseball on all men's teams. And uh, she, uh, I got to shoot her and interview her, and she let me know that um, she didn't want to switch to softball when she got to high school. So she told her dad she wanted to stay in baseball, and her dad taught her how to throw a knuckleball to keep her in the game longer and be, enable her to compete against the boys. And she did all four years at Chatham University, and I got to see her uh, start a doubleheader, and I got to see her, her knuckleball, and I can tell you that she mastered it and she got the win. So it was very exciting to see Kelly Ann Jenkins. Veronica Alvarez was a roving pitcher, uh, catching instructor, excuse me, with the Oakland A's, and now she's been promoted to international player development and works out of the Dominican Republic. And she's also the USA baseball women's coach. And there's women now in every level of baseball that's starting. It's, it's just a really exciting time to be doing this project. Rachel Balkovec is, is coaching, um, sorry, managing for the New York Yankees minor league team. Kelsey Whitmore is the only woman being paid to play baseball in the United States. She's the first woman to get, oops, a hit in the uh, Atlantic League, first woman to pitch. She is a two-way player, just like Shohei Otani. There's only two uh, currently two-way players in baseball, and that's Kelsey and Shohei. Olivia Pichardo is the first woman to play D1 baseball at Brown University at 18 years old, and she's from Queens, which I love. There's women colleges now. There's more and more colleges are starting to have club teams, and we're seeing more women teams, women staying in the game longer. Berkeley University now has a women's college baseball team. And the youth is where it's at. There is over 1,000 girls playing baseball across the United States, mostly thanks to an organization called Baseball for All. 
And why is this all happening? Well, as longtime female umpire Perry Barber is fond of saying, if you can see it, you can be it. And just like our first initiative, this is so much more than about baseball. Oh, this one works. Okay. You play ball like a girl! of mine is just gratitude, just reflecting on the women who inspired me when I was getting into the game and thinking about, man, if I hadn't had them, where would I be? What took so long for someone to hire Kim to be a GM? I don't know, but I'm glad they did. Yeah. Obviously, because yeah. she's here now, right? When we decided to make a change, Kim was the first person I called, and she's the only person I called. You know, growing up, we'd always play catch, my dad and I. My brother and I'd be in the front yard playing with football, all the kids, even in the house. It was just one of those things that I just, I love throwing, I love hitting, and being able to be in the outfield, be able to be on the mound. Like, how can you not love, you know, when you do it every day? And it's, it's the one thing you wake up working towards and trying to continue being a part of. She's had a lot of obstacles that she's had to overcome. Uh, being a girl playing in a boys' sport for so many years. Her ability to overcome those obstacles and continue to pursue and push forward is probably the most impressive thing. People only know Kel like Kelsey Whitmore, the girl that plays baseball, but they don't know like Kelsey. And it's crazy because it's like as time goes on, sometimes I forget like who, who is Kelsey? She has a heart that only wants to make impacts on others and she just wants to change lives. She wants to change other lives more than her own. I really wanted to play college baseball. And when I tried out, the coach cut me. And he said that they didn't have enough uniforms. It, the whole idea is like to get me to quit, which of course is never gonna happen. When girls play together, it's magical because they're so used to being the only girl. Now they can look to the right, to the left, and see someone who looks just like them and they can, in baseball for all, not just see someone to the right and left of them, they can look up and they can see someone older still playing. Girls are staying in the game longer because they now have a community. And in a small way, baseball for all has gone ahead and, and lead the girls' baseball movement. I just believe in letting kids be who they want to be. And they can grow up, and they can grow up outside the box and then become these wonderful people and these leaders that help make our world better. And it might start with a baseball game, but to me, it's the change that the world needs. It's a shame that the women that came before me were not more visible as role models, because we have a saying, if you see it, you can be it. And if you don't see it, why would you want to be it? Or why would you even know that it's available to you? When I first started, it was more about me and my upward mobility and the umpiring hierarchy. And now it's, it's much more focused on helping others attain the proficiency and the opportunity that I had to fight for. When I was growing up in the 1940s, a woman's place was at home. But I always knew it was at home first, second, and third. <laughs> Pro baseball player, 1951 to 1954. I just think about a young girl looking up and saying, what? Pro baseball player, 1951? Well, it's possible. It's in the future, though, right now. It is. It's it is in the, in the future. future. If you can see it, you can be it. If you can see it, you can be it.
I'm fond of saying that my camera has given me an entree into so many worlds that I would have otherwise never been in, and certainly had an opportunity to meet so many people that I would otherwise have never met. And so I, I just want to thank B&H and I want to thank Sony for giving me the opportunity to meet all of you today. And, and thank you for listening. <laughs>